Hey guys, Lindy Pearson here. My husband and I work with a great firm called Cressa, who just happens to be our sponsor for this episode. We're a commercial real estate firm, but unlike most firms in our industry, we only work for the tenants. We help business owners and C-level executives make better real estate and facility decisions while saving them money in the process. So welcome to Level Up, where we feature entrepreneurs, leaders, and other professionals who have demonstrated agency and innovation in their personal and professional lives. So today, our guest has over 20 years of experience in the field, Dr. Sharon Arbel, clinical psychologist in private practice, educator, consultant, and speaker, also mother of three. She provides both testing and therapy services. In therapy, she prides herself in being able to deeply connect with people and take them through what is sometimes a difficult and painful process of change and growth. She uses an eclectic approach largely based in the work of differentiation of self, and she empowers people to create the lives they want. Sharon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yes, it is my pleasure. Um, Originally, when I met you, I don't remember what month, but it was for my kids' school, Shamanad. And as a parent, uh, I really wanted to go to the Zoom because I wanted to get information that had nothing to do with my bubble, my household. I wanted to know what other people were going through. And I really, really felt, I don't know how many people were on that call, I think like 75 to 100, or maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe like I don't know. There was like 800 kids in the school. So there was, there was, a lot. <laughs> I felt like everyone on that zoom call, I felt like you were just talking to me. Like there were, there were so many things that I could relate to, whether it's my children, a friend's child, my nephew, like whatever's going on. I just was like, I, I like, I, I want your message to be out to, to more and more people. So I chose May because as we all know, it's mental health awareness month. Um, and I just, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to start with taking away the stigma, taking away the taboo and just really making it mainstream and finding out what that means to you. Yeah, I love that. That's such an important mission. I mean, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I really appreciate the fact that we're having this conversation. I think the Zoom that you attended, I was giving a virtual talk to the parents about mental health for the family at this time during this pandemic. And, um, you know, people are really struggling. It's been a really difficult 14 months and we're seeing the effects of this pandemic on people's mental health from the youngest to, you know, the oldest. It's just no discrimination, everyone's being impacted. Mm -hmm. And so I think after 14 months of this, especially given that it's Mental Health Awareness Month, this is the perfect juncture for us to have this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So when you when you talk about the families, um, again, that's something that that you were talking about on the call, but for this one in particular, I want to know why taking the whole family into consideration is critical in having I don't know. I want to say healthy, healthy health. Is that even like a word like healthy mental health? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, because when you have one person on the team, whether it's your team of your family, it's your team at work, it's your employees that you manage, whatever it is, when you're when you're not right, or someone is affecting you, I think, I think, just like we said, it's critical. So why, why would we take everyone into consideration for that? Yeah, so I look at things with a systems lens, just like what you said, we're all a part of the system, we don't operate independently, we can't, um, we can't go about things thinking, you know, we're just kind of alone on this planet. We're constantly in relationships and relating to other people. And so when I work with clients, I work with that whole lens with the whole system. So whether I have one person in the room, or six people in the room, I'm working with the whole system in my head. And I really do believe that in those interactions, that's when things come up. So you impact the family, the family impacts you. And I think that that's really where the issues are. If we look at 
the individual as having the issues, then there's something defective about that individual. And I just don't believe in that. I have a very non-pathological approach to my work. I think the, you know, the problem's not in the person. The problem is in the way that the system is relating and the way that the system is interacting. When you say the system, um, are you, I feel, I just, I just want to get this straight. The system as in like how, the society works with people with mental health disabilities or no. the system as in like whatever us as humans create together. Right. I mean, like the family is a system, like you said, the workplace is a system, a school is a system. So when I'm looking at an individual, I'm looking at that individual being a part of that system and I'm looking at how to treat the whole system in order to support the individual. You can't just like yank them out. Yeah. What, what about, um, I don't know. I, I don't want to offend anyone, but you know how there's, there's a lot of stigma around, um, you know, certain families who don't want anyone to know that maybe one of their children or they are suffering um, a parent. Uh, mother, father, it doesn't matter, gender, race, religion, um, that's, that's irrelevant. Um, but like you, you have someone who is almost paralyzed with fear, maybe because they don't want the secret to get out, or they're not getting the right help or for again, the system, the unit isn't getting help and therefore affecting the whole family. Yeah, I, you know, there's still so much stigma around getting help for mental health. It's like if we break a bone um, or, you know, we've got, you know, our kid has a fever for five days straight, then it's obvious that we're going to go to the doctor. If we need to get, you know, um, preventative medicine and preventative checkups for ourselves, for our kids, we're going to go to the doctor. And those things are obvious, but for many reasons, mental health is still not treated that way. It's like you can have really debilitating anxiety and depression and the way that our society operates is it communicates to people that that needs to be kept a secret, that that's something to be ashamed of. And so the families that are experiencing that shame they're just responding to what society is telling them. And in some cultures, that's even stronger. It just depends what your background is. But in some cultures, you know, you really can't air out your dirty laundry and you can't let people know what's going on behind closed doors. So you really need to keep that a secret. But when people keep that a secret, they don't go get help. And it's when different. you don't go get help, the problem gets worse, right? I mean, it's just, it then takes a life of its own and then it just kind of, you know, goes from there. And, and if we as, a, as parents don't go get help, it funnels down to our kids and it translates in their mental health and their struggles. And if we don't go get help for our kids, you know, that's also it just stays with them and it gets worse. These things don't tend to go away with time. But yet what we hear is it's all in your head, get over it, think positively, positive vibes, all these messages that are sent out, like you could just turn on and off anxiety with a switch, which is just not the case. Yeah, I, um, I grew up in a very conservative upbringing and you walked the line. And if you couldn't walk the line, then there's something wrong with you. Not with anything else that could go wrong. There's something wrong with you and you're failing and it's not, it's not working. And where do you go from there? Like as a minor, even um, I've, I have witnessed that in my family, in my DNA. And there are, there are times where I think to myself, well, Back then, whatever that means, um, they really didn't know about mental health issues. They really didn't pay attention to that. And the level of conservancy was like way, way, way out there. Well, now, a couple of generations later, 
as people are starting to talk about it and really putting some empathy behind all of this. Now it's like, okay, well, that's great that three generations just flew by and we're still trying to get this taboo out there. So what, what are some of the ways that people could go about getting help if maybe they don't have someone in their workplace or their familial unit or something like that? I love that because people, for some reason, think that in order to get help, you've got to be rich. And that is just not the case. Um, in Los Angeles, where you and I are from, you can get therapy from nothing, zero dollars per session to four hundred dollars per session and everything in between. So if you have insurance or Medi-Cal, you can activate that. Um, if you you know, there are many community mental health centers that will offer sliding scale or just like a symbolic type of. Um, pay system where you pay $5 per session or $20 per session. And then there are all these great resources that are available online that are not therapy. I want to clarify, not therapy, but really important um, supportive resources that, you know, there's uh, free um, webinars and eBooks and um, journals, you know, self-help journals and things like that. There's just so much out there because today there is more awareness about this. And today, especially being in the midst of a pandemic, yeah. we really need to provide people with all of that support and all those resources. So there's just a ton out there. It's just a matter of being willing to look and being willing to accept the help. So what about for some of the people who um, maybe don't have the mom or um, maybe not necessarily a mom, uh, a legal guardian that that can help them with it. I know that you have some social media coping groups, um, your YouTube channel. I know that there's things where people can search on the internet. They can find things. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that they're maybe comfortable with talking about yet. Maybe they're still doing some sort of internal work, thinking to themselves, you know what, something's not clicking here or something used to click and now it's not clicking. And I don't like, again, I don't, I don't have anyone to go to. Um, what, where do you tend to go to um, or send some of your clients to that could do something on their own that wouldn't need a parental or legal guardian? Yes. So at the start of the pandemic, I started a coping with COVID Facebook group where I posted so many free resources, interesting articles, coping tools. Um, I then turned it into an ebook that's available on my website. Really, really quick. What, Don't what's, share. what's the name of your Facebook social media group? It's called Coping with COVID. Coping with uh, COVID. Tools for Emotional Wellness. Okay. something to that. I don't remember the whole title coping with COVID. And then we took that and we created an ebook for coping with the psychological effects of this pandemic. And that's available on my website at drsharonarbell.com. And there's so many things like that available on the web. So I think it's really about just kind of starting to look and read and practice my absolute favorite um, app. It's called Calm, C-A-L-M, Calm. And it's available for download on any device. And it's got all these mindfulness tools, meditations, visualization exercises, all of these activities and interventions that we know that have been researched, that we know help with anxiety, depression, sleep difficulty, um, you know, loneliness yeah. and all of those things that people might be experiencing right now. So those mindfulness apps, that's another place where I send people on a regular basis. Um, I'm going to keep on going with the kid theme because you mother of three, I'm, I birthed two children, but I really have like four and everyone else out there listening who has their own personal story um, whether you're a mom, a dad, a caregiver, a care, like anything, um, you know, over over a year of social distancing, a two week isolation experiment, something. And now we're 
for over a year. Um, yeah. It's a lot of stuff going on in over a year. You want to talk about systems and society and things not being able to be reported, um, domestic violence. I mean, there's like so many things. So before I get into everything, um, over, over a year of social distancing, what, how do you stay motivated? Like I have in my notes, like losing a year in school, losing out of business. Like I said, I do commercial real estate. Nobody was going into the office. People were scared of the office. They were scared of being in an elevator. Um, you know, it's like the economy, the traffic, everything. What, what do you, how do you, how do you cope with that? I think it's really important for people to stay focused on what they can control because the last year has introduced so many variables that we couldn't control so many things that felt like they were spiraling out of control. And one of the things that I worked with my clients on was focusing on what is it is that I can control. So if I look at my day and I wake up in the morning and from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to sleep, what are the things that I can control throughout my day? And keeping your eye on the ball in that way is really helpful. Something else that has been really helpful for people is to keep up a routine. I think you remember at the start of this pandemic, people just didn't have a routine. They like didn't get out of their pajamas for months on end. And, you know, kids were kind of barely in school, they were sleeping until noon, everybody's routine was off. But there's comfort in routine. And that predictability, that lowers anxiety. When we know what's coming next, sure. that's that gives us a sense of certainty, that gives us a sense of control. 100%. So keeping up a routine, as, as small and mundane as that routine may be for you, keeping up that routine is super important for kind of staying afloat right now. Yeah. Yeah. Even something as simple as your sleep patterns. That's like one mm -hmm. thing I noticed uh, both my husband and I went in opposite directions as the children and, you know, again, morning sleep routines, getting up, eating breakfast before school. And you got to be like on it, on it. Come on, guys. What are you doing? What are you doing? Come on, guys. Come on, guys. And then you turn into this two headed nagging monster that's trying to get these kids just get their eyeballs open to get on their damn laptops to get on the online school. Like it's it's hard for all parties. You know, it's right. like it really is. Yeah. And, you know, the kids who did better were the kids who were waking up half an hour, hour before school, changing out of their clothes, eating breakfast, um, kind of getting uh, like adjusted to the day. Those kids did better than the kids who were just kind of like popping their eyes open, munching on a waffle while in bed trying to get their um, virtual, you know, distance learning set up. So we know that routine is comforting to kids and adults. Right. Yeah. Um, how, how can a, what could, what, what advice can you give a parent, um, myself included, that has to do with self-esteem from the kids and maybe from yourself as well, this, this, this isn't just a family oriented conversation. Um, like for instance, for me, um, I talk about how can I measure success for myself? I'm in business development. I'm in client relations. I'm about events. I'm about connecting people. And that's a very social aspect when you're smack dab in the middle of COVID. Um, and you know, zoom tiles aren't for everyone. I get that. Um, but like measuring success for myself, I had to really look at my life in, in such a different way. And again, being an adult doing this, I do have the tools. I do have the goals. I do have the capacity, but now turn into this teenager or this person who's online school eating waffles in bed with the camera off and they haven't even brushed their teeth. How, like, how, how do you motivate them? How do you how do you help them with, with some of their, their self-esteem? An example would be like my son just started uh, Chaminade. Uh, he's a freshman. He has no one to call like in his class to see like, hey, I didn't get the notes. I didn't do this. No one to do any of this. 
And so yeah. I have watched his self-esteem go down a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I bet. I think it's two really important things. Number one, kids are watching us. They're watching us all the time. And so the way that we care for ourselves always, but during this time, of course, it's been a little more challenging. The way that we take care of ourselves, the things that we do for ourselves to take care of, like, like recharge our soul and take care of our own stress and anxiety, they're watching that. And so I think it's really important for kids to have that modeling. We can't just say to them, you know, you got to be motivated and you got to get up before school starts when we're in our pajamas, not exercising (laughs) and drinking a bottle of wine every day, which many adults did throughout this pandemic. You know, I mean, alcohol abuse has been up hundreds of percentages. It's just, it's really quite overwhelming. So we can't expect from the kids what we're not modeling. They're just, they're not going to, listen to our words, they're going to mimic our actions. Well, and the second thing is, I think parents need to lean in to kids. Right now is the time to use that relationship, to lean in, to talk, to be present emotionally, to let them talk, let them unravel if they need to, to just really um, step out of that role of, you know, being the cop. And step into that role of just using that relationship and understanding that they're going through a really tough time and they don't have the coping skills. They just, you know, that the part of the brain that is responsible for judgment and planning and using coping skills and all of that, that part of the brain, it's called our frontal lobe. It's not developed until our 20s. So our kids, they just, they really, they just, they don't have that part of the brain that is necessary to get through this time. We've got to be their frontal lobe. We have to lean into the relationship. We have to use our own modeling. We have to use our own self care to show them how to get through. I like that. Lean into the relationship. I think that goes with Earlier today, uh, I gave a presentation about active listening. And there's so many times where I want to be like, respond, respond, respond. And I'm thinking about respond, whatever is in that sentence, that maybe the last sentence you said I'm not listening to. Or maybe I'm like, you know, thinking about whatever thought I have here. So like leaning in to me is more like zip your lip. No one's asking you for advice. Your son, daughter, whoever is just needs someone to talk to. And sometimes if you can just say, I'm listening, I'm here for you. I heard you. Maybe that's just enough. Yeah. And sometimes realize that they're not ready to talk, but you still show up and you still show up with that parental presence and you sit in their room every day for half an hour, just hanging out, eventually they'll start to talk. And some kids, they like to talk while they're doing things and they'll open up, you know, it's hard to just have that eye contact and have that intensity in the conversation. But if they're doing something, if they're walking, hiking, biking, baking, painting, then it's easier for them to open up. Right. You just got to know your child and you've got to try it from different angles, but you've got to lean in and you've got to really try to use yourself, use that relationship to get them through. A little more on the comical side, but I'm sure every parent goes through this. Do you have any thoughts on the excessive, which I'm not even sure if that's the right word because it's like excessive times like the umpteenth power um, excessive TikTok use and screen time and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, I know that like all of us are on screen time more. Um, I'm doing calls all the time and I'm exhausted from being on all day and to think like I can't just veg out and now I have homework and now I have this to do and now I have that to do. Um, I don't know. I think, I think it, 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 it like boggles down the mind and I don't know if it was something you wrote or I just read, 
um, on your website, but something about, I'm, I'm going to get this all wrong. Quoting about like your memory, like the less you use it, the, the more it like shrinks or some sort of something. Was that trauma and memory? Trauma. You read what I wrote about trauma and memory. Yeah. And COVID is kind of like trauma. Like, I know it is. Oh, oh, it absolutely is. I mean, no question about it. This is getting etched in the trauma center of our brain. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I look at my kids and I'm like, do we need to go see someone? Should we go figure this out? Because like you did something a month ago and you can't remember now. Um, and it's, and I mean, it's, it's really honest to goodness, lack of motivation. And then it go it kind of yeah. goes from there. What about something like, I mean, it's lack of mo- go ahead. No, you go. I mean, it's lack of motivation, but it's also boredom. You know, they didn't have much stimulation. Everything got taken away from them pretty much overnight. Yes. Their extracurricular activities, their sports and hobbies, the social interaction, the um, places to go, the birthday parties, the outings, it all got taken away from them. So then that, that got replaced by just a ton of screen time. And then parents into this role of policing all the screen time. You know? <gasps> <laughs> you're, I hate that role. Yeah. It's hard because then you're in a constant battle. So between the get up and brush your teeth and get some exercise and are you on your Zoom call and, you know, what are you playing? You're not allowed to play that. And how many hours have you been oh, on? No. And- oh, no, mom. Oh, no, mom. Oh, no. I'm just I'm just I'm just texting someone for homework. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm yeah. Not. <laughs> so, you know what? This is what I'm telling parents. Step out of that police role, offer them something else and don't offer it like, hey, do you want to go for a hike? Because if you ask a teenager if they'd rather <laughs> stay online with their friends or go for a hike with their parents, <laughs> I mean, it's like there's no competition there. Right. But when you fill up your family life with feel good things with things that are meaningful to different people in the family. And some of those activities are full family activities. And some of them are dyads, you know, like just one parent and child, just Mm -hmm. one-on-one time. Mm -hmm. When you fill up your family life with that, then there's just naturally less screen time because there's more to do and there's, it, it's fun for them. You know, it's interesting, but then when there's nothing to do and they're not allowed to see their friends and, you know, they're stuck at home, then of course they're going to reach for the TikTok. Yeah. I really don't like TikTok. I mean, I think it's a great app, but it's really too much in my household. Yeah. It's hard for a lot of families. Yeah. So we talked about the kids, which are a major portion of my life, your life, our Mm -hmm. lives. Um, What about like the entrepreneurial outlook? You know, we have a lot of people talking about going back to the office. Um, We have this, this uh, new word, what are they calling it? Hoteling. So it's basically like in the office sector, people get to have like their own hybrid schedules and they kind of like take their stuff with them and they bring it. So whatever germs or however, whatever your, your comfort level is, everyone's able to be, you know, cross the T's and, and dot the I's kind of thing. So now, now you have people that have gone through some level of trauma, you know, whether you, whether your business you know, hightailed it and COVID really propelled it. Now you're dealing with, you know, certain kind of stresses or your business is down and you're trying to get, you know, PPP loans and SBA loans and like all that stuff. So you might not have any sort of mental illness or you might not be diagnosed with anything in your family or DNA or anything, but you're still going through a level of trauma. You're going through a level of stress. How how do you... How do you propose some of the business leaders, um, you know, chiefs, executives, how, how would you go about doing something of, of that magnitude? I think it's important to understand that this is an adjustment. Yeah. 
right now, 14 months into this pandemic, we're seeing different symptoms than we did at the beginning. So right now there's a lot of burnout. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of low motivation, fatigue, um, Makes sense. You know, and that's different than the really high intense anxiety that we were seeing last March and April. It just looks different now. And I think that people really need to be aware of that. So when you're talking about the workforce and you're talking about transitioning back into the workforce and really it looking so different, I think people really need to understand that there is a very big burnout factor here. People are just struggling to muster up the energy to kind of get back on their feet and build their business back up or, you know, show up fully in whatever role they had at work. So I think it's important to understand that and to maybe even bring in some support into your business to build up some motivation and Mm -hmm. take care of your employees in a way that, you know, takes care of them on the inside and just kind of builds up that 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 positive kind of sense of community and work ethic and all of that and then understanding that it's a transition it's going to take some time to build back up and it's going to take some time to kind of get back to where we were before and to be patient with yourself and you know if you're an entrepreneur with your employees i think that's important too Yeah, I am. Before COVID, I was like a scheduling freak. I don't know, like if it wasn't on my calendar, it didn't exist kind of thing. And then that's just cut to six months ago. um, When finally, you're like here, COVID's like, slow down, slow down, slow down, you finally get here, you're like, okay, I'm good with the no traffic, I'm good with taking 75 walks a day Mm -hmm. or wherever you are. And, and then all of a sudden, boom, like that, get back in the rat race, keep on going and you got to go faster and you got to do this and you got to do that. Um, I think that's what I'm hearing a lot of. And I could, I could definitely vouch for that. There's, there's times where I look at my calendar and I'm like, how do I use the restroom? How do I eat? And how do I have space to still be efficient in the office and still do all my online schooling, my online schooling, which is really my children <laughs> feel like double checking. And again, being that like, what did you call it? I call it Hitler, which is probably extremely inappropriate, but like to nag them and to tell them what to do to be the police, to police them. Like how, yeah, how, yeah like how, how does that work? Yeah, it's overwhelming to think of it that way. And I think so many of us are looking at the transition right now back into school and life and work and thinking like, oh, my God, we have 14 months of catch up to do. So let's just pretend like none of this ever happened and like we weren't affected by all of it. And it wasn't this big trauma that rattled us completely. And let's just play the catch up game. And that's just not realistic. You've got to be compassionate with yourself. You've got to be patient with yourself and understand that we've just been through a lot and we're still going through it. This is, it's not over. As a matter of fact, researchers are saying that the mental health impact of this pandemic is going to last far longer than the pandemic itself and, oh. and the physical the, the scare to the, to our physical health, okay. the mental health impact is going to last for many more years than that. And so we can't, we can't just jump right in. We can't just say, Oh, okay, now that's it. It's over. I got to catch up on 14 months. No, we've been greatly impacted and it's been a really rough 14 months. And many people have experienced a tremendous amount of grief And we're not here to compare whose grief was bigger, but everyone experienced it on some level. And right now we need to slowly transition back into whatever sense of normal your life can offer 
with a sense of self-compassion, with a sense of patience and understanding that this was a very big life event that we can't just ignore and move past. Yeah, we can't. Yeah, not at all. Um, okay, so we did work, we did kids, and now, dun 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 dun, amazing marriage. Um, we have again a whole spectrum of that too. Um, like like we mentioned before, there's there's a lot of things that are going unreported, um, and this is you know this the sad part of being stuck in, or I don't know, not being stuck, but just domestic violence, unhappiness, um, yeah. un, unhealthy routines, let's just put it like that, um, whether it's recreational drugs, excessive alcohol use. Um, how, how, like, what, what are you seeing out there? What are you seeing that that is the most effective way to, to go about having altercations of any sort? Well, you said stuck, and I do want to go back to that word, be, that word, because many people were stuck together. They did not want to be stuck together. You know, yeah. there were many great things that happened as a result of this pandemic. It, it really did wonders for many families in terms of spending quality time together and just kind of getting to know each other again and having all of that time together. But there are families that were stuck together and there are marriages where spending so much time together in the house cooped up without interaction with the outside world translated to some pretty dangerous uh, things. And yes, domestic violence has been on the rise throughout this pandemic. And that's scary because when you are stuck at home with somebody who's abusing you and you don't have contact with the outside world and you don't have, you know, work to go to and no to outlet. To about it. Yeah, absolutely. It, so it's been really scary, but even in those families where there isn't domestic violence, the marriages have really been burdened. Um, and if your marriage wasn't doing great before this pandemic, then, uh Oh, this pandemic just kind of piled a ton of bricks on it. Um, there were just so many things, you know, just managing kids. If you have kids, then, you know, you've, you just, you have like 20 or 30 reasons to fight with your partner per day because, you know, having kids at home and trying to work during this pandemic was incredibly stressful. And, you know, many women had to step out of the workforce. Almost 1 million American women stepped out of the workforce this past September. Wow. Because they had to take care of, yeah. This is because they had to take care of their kids. This is just in the US? Yeah. Almost 1 million. That's a lot. It's, it is. It's pretty profound. And, so you know, it, it has implications for what these women are experiencing. They're experiencing grief. They're frustrated. They didn't necessarily want to quit their jobs or, you know, reduce their hours. But the reality is, is that taking care of children does fall disproportionately on women, more on women, on mothers than it does on fathers. And so all these women stepped out of the workforce and that's not necessarily something they're happy with. That's not necessarily something they're proud of. And so that inserted another stressor on marriages, right? Because you've got all these yeah. grieving, upset women. They're not wanting to be home. You know, this is not the life they signed up for. They love their careers. They love their jobs. They enjoy that role. And here they are. Yeah. having to be full-time moms. Yep. There, I, 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 there's been times where I've been doing dishes at night and my feet are kind of like, Oh, I'm sick of standing here and I had a long day. And then my brain just kind of goes astray into this little, I want to say unhappy zone, but just, you know, it's like, I've had enough. I'm ready to like turn the lights off kind of thing upstairs and you can't because you have 10 other things still to do. And there's, there's been, for me personally, there's been a lot of things that I've had to reorganize in terms of routine. I've had to reschedule. And the biggest thing that 
I've, I've learned at least through entrepreneurial dealings is that I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry for canceling. I'm not sorry for making something later. I'm not sorry because my daughter decided to hyperextend her knee at soccer practice the night before. And I can't get up the next morning because I was at the ER all day, which did happen. Um, but you know, there's, there's, there's things where like, you know, I don't see like a, again, I don't know if this is politically correct, but I don't see like a group of guys getting around and being like, Oh man, I'm so sorry. I couldn't do that. Oh man. I'm, I'm just so sorry. I had to do this. You know, it's more like, no, this came up. We're rescheduling. Um, so I think, I think that like equal playing field is still being, um, like sought after right and after a whole day of trying to juggle work and kids and all that it's really hard at that point to try to connect with your partner so there was just no time for the marriage you know and then yeah. you're having you know all of these different factors burdening the marriage and no time alone and no outings there's like date nights were canceled for so long you no know there was no time. time yeah there was no time there was no there was no time for the marriage and that added up you know 14 months of that it adds up and i think really it's now time to bring back all of that stuff yeah bring back the fun bring back the date nights bring back the focus on the marriage, the time alone, you know, that's really important because I really do believe that the marriage is the hub of the family. And when the marriage is not doing well, nobody's doing well. Yeah. I can, I can actually tell you this because we're not going to be airing um, today, but I had to ask a very nice friend of mine um, that I network with, I'm at the office too. Hopefully Ricky doesn't hear me. I had to ask him if I could put his name on our calendar so we can, so I can surprise my husband because it's our anniversary to go to dinner. And that's tonight. We haven't had a good date night in so long. However, he comes to me today, this morning, and he says, I'm really sorry, but I forgot to put a board meeting on my calendar tonight. Can you go to the happy hour by yourself? No, I like I start sweating because I'm like, what do I say? What do I do? Like, it's not even a real meeting. And like, we can't even go to dinner. So that's the long version of it will be rescheduled. But yes, it is. It is hard to get things like alone time and, and just sit and be your individual selves together. Because that's why we got together in the first place. Right. I fell in love with this man. He fell in love with this woman. And then together, whatever we're creating and and. um yeah, marriage, marriage can be a little difficult when you don't have that that one on one time. Absolutely. Yes. So if you had um, a couple things to fill your toolbox with um, your coping toolbox. Um, I love that you use those words. I have used those words forever and ever. It's like a little toolbox that's just like you imagine things that you can take out of it. It's like your little Mary Poppins hat or something. And it's all the tools. What could you give to our listeners as a coworker and no, no, no apparent order coworker, a parent, um, and, and a woman. What are three? What could I give them in terms of what? Tell me what you mean in their toolbox, what, what would be something good for them to, for, for all of us to be practicing as we, as we re-enter the next normal, the new normal, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, I would definitely say that mindfulness is something that's really important, like having a mindfulness practice and taking time every day to just smell the roses, whatever your, the, your version of that is, mm -hmm. just slow down and kind of center yourself and, you know, uh, just kind of ground yourself. Lots of mindfulness tools out there for people to check out apps and, you know, lots of YouTube videos and exercises. I would say that that's really important. And then, um, you know, I think it's 
in the simple things. I think it's in the, our sleep routines, our eating routines, our exercise routines, our socializing, like th those are the four eating, sleeping, exercising, and socializing. If you check those boxes every day and you make sure you're giving yourself some of those, you know, some of those mm -hmm. routines and some of that stability and some of that comfort and consistency, yeah. you'll feel better. You'll feel so much better if you clean up those four areas of your life and you make sure that you're operating in kind of a healthier way around those four different areas, you'll feel a lot better. I already feel a lot better talking mm -hmm. to you. That's mm -hmm. why I like you. Oh, I, I'm so happy to hear that. It's been really great talking to you over the last hour. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it really just, just gives people a sense of, can we start the way we came into this world? And it's just being human. Yeah. Just be a human. Like what, sure. what does being a human mean to you? Does it mean if you don't like what someone's doing, that's like bite their head off? Or does it mean, hmm, I wonder what this person's got going on because there's a little bit of friction, whether it's your, one of your fetuses, which I call my teenage children at this point, because since we've mm -hmm. progressed a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, your relationship or your, your work your place of work, which could, you know, mean a lot of things to a lot of people. You don't, you don't have the money to pay your bills, man, you got, you got a lot of problems going on. So you really do have to kind of share your feelings and be able to share them in a truly like in a place where you can actually be heard, not in a place of judgment really is what it comes down to. Right. No one wants to be judged. And if you're judged, then you're, you're defensive. And when you're defensive, it's, it's like a fight or flight, which is the opposite of what we're trying to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think we really have to know like people are fighting an inner battle and we can't see that inner battle and everyone's got it. I talk to people about this all the time. Every single person walking this earth has got anxiety, some to a lesser degree, some to a greater degree, but everyone's managing some degree of anxiety everyone's managing an inner struggle and just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. So yes, be kind, be patient with yourself, with other people, be human. Like you said, you know, really just kind yeah. of yeah. do your best. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for being on this uh, amazing episode and sharing all of your knowledge. Um, you're amazing. Um, you help. Yeah. You help fight like stigmas, you provide support, you educate me, the public, whoever wants to listen, schools, parents, um, and just advocating for policies that support people everywhere. I think more of us need to stand up. I think more of us need to be available to be able to do that. You have the online schooling, which Hopefully in a month or two, we'll be done with that. Um, I think, I think it's important for these teenagers to get out and, um, and just like juggling with everything, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure all you parents out there know what I'm talking about. Um, in in regards to parents, Mother's Day is soon. So happy Mother's Day to all you mamas out there, but you know, just kind of like bridging the gap like really bridging the gap that that's, that's what I want this episode to do. I, I want people to think about when they have issues with whoever it is in whatever household, workplace, or organization, just really stop and think. Like everyone has a story. Please be empathetic. Right. Please be empathetic with everyone and take a holistic approach when you're dealing with anyone. Um, you, can, you can find Sharon on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, her website, which is, let me just check, it is www.arbelassociates.com. Um, like she said before, she has got ebooks and programs, and she would be more than happy to be able to put you in the right direction should you be feeling any loss. So, Sharon, absolutely. Thank you again for being here. Anything for the listeners before we go? 
Just, I think it, this episode coming out during Mental Health Awareness Month, share it. Share it. Help us get, you know, the message out there. Help us fight the stigma. Do your part uh, to increase awareness. That would be great. That would be a, absolutely. that would be my ask. Perfect. Thank you, Sharon. Till next time. Thank you.